Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Loading. I am so fortunate and grateful to be joined today by a really important person that has really helped me out a ton. He is a motivational speaker, a widely recognized leadership and thought leader, and also a New York Times bestselling author for his book, The 12 Week Year, also with another book that recently came out called Uncommon Accountability, both great reads, Brian Moran. Brian, thank you for joining me. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's good to be with you, Derek. Tell me a little bit about your background and kind of how you got started in the leadership world and how you got started speaking. And Yeah, I started out at UPS. I was working in the evenings, paying my way through college, and um, they actually promoted me to supervising that. I was getting a degree in physiology to be a strength coach, but I, I took the promotion, thought it might be interesting. And that's really when I switched to business. I, I never had any interest in business till till I moved into that supervisory role. Then I then I started to enjoy it. Moved to California, got in with PepsiCo, and early on, I, Derek, I just became a student of leadership and and productivity. Right, what works, what doesn't work. <clears throat> Had cassette tapes that I'd listen to in the car, and all these kinds of programs just feeding my mind, you know, stuff that I thought would help me perform better and help me be a better leader. And you know, from that, <clears throat> uh, joined a consulting firm, was very successful there. One of the clients offered me a position as vice president of sales and service, and then eventually went on my own and um, kind of started doing my own thing based on all the experience I had had um, working with all these other companies. So. How long before you wrote the 12 week year, would you say that you started going out on your own? It was a while. Yeah. I'd have to, I'd have to think about that, but it wasn't, it wasn't out of the gate. You okay. know, we wrote a precursor to that book that we self published called periodization 12 weeks to breakthrough. Okay. And we had been, We'd been working with the concept for a while and we were headed to a trade show and just wanted to document what we were doing. Right. And so, as I mentioned, we self-published that. We, we sold them for 10 bucks a copy. I think we printed a hundred copies. And then from that sold a couple hundred thousand copies of that book. So it literally changed our business, changed our life. And then later got a chance to um, really publish it with Wiley and expand it a little bit. When you started out on your own, did you start going into consulting, like leadership coaching? And was that all started with your partner, Michael, who you wrote the book with, correct? Yeah, yeah. So first I started out on my own. Michael was in, um, in Europe and the Middle East working. Okay. Um, and I just started to work with local CEOs, local business owners um, on helping them be more effective. And uh, that's where it all started. And that was... Obviously, that's the um, the premise of the book, the 12 week year, right? Kind of being more effective in 12 weeks than you are in an entire year. And that came about because you were documenting and writing the precursor for that trade show. So I would say what what would be like the main difference between that original copy that you wrote compared to the book that so many people and that has done so well for you as a New York Times bestseller? Yeah, really, um, you know, the, the new book's in two parts. The first part is very much like the original, mm -hmm. um, but that was it, right? We didn't, we cut out all the stories. We cut out all the, all the extras. And when we published it with Wiley, we got a chance to expand it. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a back half to that. Right. But the first 64 pages in that book is very much like the original book we self-published. I know for our company and for myself personally, I've seen results firsthand from the book, but also expanding on that from to like the course that you kind of run and, and achieve. So when did that all come about after you, I guess, wrote the book, the 12 week year? You know, some of that, some of that existed before the book because okay. <clears throat> Michael and I didn't come up with this idea and sit down and write about it. We just documented what we were doing. Now it's all evolved since then, right. And gotten better and, and some nuances on it, but, but you know, the basic fundamentals were there before we wrote the book. We had been working with clients on them. That's how we knew it worked. Mm -hmm. right? We weren't just sitting down, putting down a theory in hopes right. that it worked. We had dozens of places we had worked with where it, it had proved, we'd proved it out. Yeah. And then that obviously set the basis for the book, I guess, which, which makes sense because you, you tested it out beforehand and then put it into the book because mm -hmm. you've seen these practices work. So I guess the book essentially developed from the course itself, and then you kind of made it 
like a package deal and you started going around speaking about it is, is the way that you spoke about the 12 week year before what you brought to the trade show back when you first started. Is that kind of what you talked about? Yeah, pretty much an earlier version of it, but you know, that's what we were doing. We were helping, we, we decided early on that our niche was going to be helping um, individuals and organizations execute, <clears throat> right? They've all got great ideas. They've all got resources. So, you know, that led us to kind of the 12 week year system mm -hmm. as an execution system. Um, and then the 12 weeks as a year was really kind of the accelerant. It's, it gets, it gets you out of that annual environment. There's a healthy sense of urgency that exists each week in a 12 week year that doesn't exist in a 12 month cycle. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, you got this fundamental disciplines and principles kind of bundled in the context of that. And that's what makes it so effective. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the biggest impact for me when reading the 12 week year and also uncommon accountability is the main focus is really on your mindset and being able to make yourself believe that you can accomplish these things in 12 weeks if you set the right tasks and the right goals for yourself. So talk a little bit about, I guess, the importance of the mindset. And when you say that for a 12 week year, the most important aspect of it is growing your mindset and having that impact on your mindset in general. Yeah, I think mindset is everything in life. I think most of life is between the ears. Mm -hmm. And and so how you think about things drives your actions, drives your results. And and so one of the fundamental shifts in thinking with the 12 week year is you get out of that annual environment. Mm -hmm. And as you know, you know our clients work in the context of every 12 weeks as a year. And by the way, there are four of those in the year mm. that's annualized again. There's just this 12 week year followed by the next. And, and so as you do that, right, it's a different mindset. There's a hard line in the sand that's uh, at furthest out is 12 weeks away. So, so when you embrace that, what happens is the rest of your thinking shifts as well, right? That notion that you've got lots of time is gone. And so you procrastinate less, you work more consistently, and you build momentum that way. And the results start to come online a lot quicker. Um, but it is, it is first and foremost, a, a mindset shift. Definitely. And for, uh, I know I've recommended this book to a lot of people. So some people here might have read the book or learned about it. But what one thing I really personally love about the 12 week year in general, is that you kind of work back. Yeah, it is the a 12 weeks, but you work back, you start with like your long term goal, and then you break it down to like a, a shorter three year term goal. And then what you might want your yearly goal to look like, and then you can also break it down into the 12 weeks. So it kind of works back from, I guess, what you want to accomplish most in life, and then how you can set good habits and good tactics to get yourself to that point. Yeah, in a sense, your 12 week goals are, are reverse engineered from your long term vision, right? Mm -hmm. You start with that and then making sure that the goals we're setting are 12 weeks are in alignment with that and really enable that. So there's that connection. And so you're leaning into that that future that you desire every 12 weeks. Yeah. And, and in the book, I know uh, a thing that we talk about is the lead and lag indicators. That's a big portion of it because you have your lag indicators, which are like your goals that you want to achieve. Right. But the important part of it is setting proper lead indicators so that you can really accomplish the the tactics you need to accomplish every day because that's the point in it right it's the point is to make sure you're setting up good tactics for yourself every single day during the week in order to set yourself up for those lag indicators at the end of those 12 weeks yeah yeah the lags are the are the the goals the measurement of the goal so it's it's sales revenue if you're in sales it's weight loss if you're trying to lose weight right Mm -hmm. um, the lead indicators are measures that have a strong correlation to the end of result, and they may or may not be actions, mm -hmm. right? So, um, but just, just, you know, having the courage to measure your performance, right? Because there's feedback in that, in that measurement. And, and so many people shy away from that. There's a lot of head trash about what measurement is and isn't. And you really just got to think about it as feedback. And so some of it, when you, when you do, when you look at it, it doesn't look very positive, right? It's not right. very encouraging, but nonetheless, there's, there's insights in it on how you can adjust and where you can adapt. Um, and if you never look at it, then you're really handicapping yourself. Yeah, ab absolutely. Because it's important to, and it, and it's not just a business thing, it's life goals as well. Because a lot of the point of it is to work with individuals that are 
uh, whether it's sales, like you said, or people in the business world. But a lot of this can go to, I mean, I saw the most growth personally in my physical health when I set these goals, because it was going to the gym and working out consistently and eating the right things and putting the right things in your body. So it, this book not only goes to people who are in business, and that's something I want to talk about because not everyone on here is going to be in that sort of world. It also goes to your personal life, like how to have, you, you gave an example on how to, I guess, be a better, like be more involved in your kids' lives because it's really easy to, to get distracted by that sort of thing. So I think a great thing about this is it incorporates your entire life in the entire world, not just business world of things. Yeah, it works equally well. And sometimes it works even better in a sense in your personal life because you have more direct control, right? If I'm gonna lose weight, I don't need to get a bunch of people to buy into that, right? I can control that more directly. Um, and we work holistically. If, if, you're, if your business life is great, but your personal life sucks, that's not so fun. If it's the reverse, still not so fun. So, right. so let's, you know, let's focus in the areas that we want to get traction in and make some improvement in personally and professionally. Yeah, absolutely. Another thing I think is important to the 12 weeks, not only setting the proper goals and setting the right tactics, but it's also having someone you talk about your WAM groups, your accountability partners, right? That, that I think is a, is a big part of it. How big would you say having someone else that kind of sees it from an outside perspective when you're doing these goals, especially in the business world, has helped a lot of people when it comes to these lag lead and lag indicators and performance? Yeah, I think an outside perspective is, is helpful. Certainly peer support, whether it's outside the company or within the company, is critical, right? If you're going it alone, you're really stacking the odds against yourself. And so, you know, meeting with a couple other people once a week to just talk about how you're progressing on your goals and, and your, your actions, um, you'll perform better. And again, whether that, whether you're working collectively as part of a large organization or whether you're uh, just working personally on as a solopreneur or on your personal goals. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's best off that you have someone, for instance, I have a partner, I work with my dad. So having him as my accountability partner, or do you want someone kind of outside perspective that you kind of respect their decision because you know that they'll be the ones to give you full and honest transparency when it comes to this? Yeah, it's a good question. The, the real thing is, um, it doesn't matter whether they're inside or out. The real thing, the important thing is that you're candid with one another. Mm. And because that, that, <clears throat> that relationship isn't about, it's not a mentoring relationship, right? It's not a relationship where I'm going to tell you specifically what you should do in your business. Mm -hmm. It's really a relationship where I'm just plugging into you and you're, <clears throat> you're being candid with me about how you're performing. And, and I'm just kind of pressing in on that a little bit about what's working, what's not working. But <clears throat> the, the, the one challenge is if I get someone, sometimes if I get someone, your instance with your dad, that can become more of a report out where you're reporting to him. Uh, nothing wrong with that, but that's not peer support. Right. And, <clears throat> or, or within the company, the boss, everyone's reporting out to the boss, which is fine, but that's not peer support. And so really looking for that peer support where you're going to be candid with some folks about how you're performing. They're going to do the same with you. And then you're just going to encourage and challenge one another. Like you said, it is being able to have that peer support, but also when you have someone else that you're meeting with consistently, or it has that accountability aspect of things, because when you have someone else kind of looking out for you, um, you have that accountability, which I think kind of leads into uncommon accountability because that, that book talks a lot about being able to hold yourself accountable in a positive way, right? Yeah. The, what we talk about in that book is really redefining accountability because most people experience accountability as consequences, right? Someone right. in authority uh, <clears throat> creating some sort of negative consequence when they don't do what they're supposed to do. And, and that's not accountability. Accountability is really ownership. Mm -hmm. And it's based on free will choice that no matter what the situation is, we always have choice. And so recognizing the choices that I have, taking ownership of those choices creates better outcomes in our life across the full spectrum of our life. You know, if, if you're struggling in an area, mm -hmm. typically you're looking outside of yourself, right? And you're waiting for someone or something to change. Whereas if you took ownership of the situation, um, you would start to behave differently and it'll change when you're waiting on someone or something else, you're giving away your power mm -hmm. to really affect the future and create the, the future you desire. 
it ultimately is up to us, right? We're the ones who create our own future and we're the ones who are putting the work in, not anyone else, especially if you want to make it as an entrepreneur or, or whatever it may be. You're the one that essentially is going to have to hold yourself accountable. But like you said, there's always been forever. You think when you think of accountability, you think they should be held accountable for the actions if they do something wrong. But accountability doesn't have to be painted in such a negative light which I know is something you talk about in here, because when you hold yourself accountable, that's where you grow most. And that's where you can see the greatest results for yourself in your life and your business and whatever it may be. Absolutely. It's, it's probably, I think it's the most empowering concept you have to live the life you want to live when you really understand accountability for what it is, it's choice, it's ownership. Because, because to, to know that then forces you to look at the situations differently, right? It's a different mindset again. Um, I'm not looking outside of myself. I'm looking at what I can control, mm -hmm. which is, you know, my thinking, and my actions, mm -hmm. and that's it. But that's enough to create the kind of world I want to live in, the kind of success I want to have, <clears throat> if I really take ownership of that. And yeah. so I'm not, I'm not driven by what other people may or may do. I'm driven by, you know, my internal compass, my goals, and and what I can control. Yeah, and I think that is kind of a, a problem in today's society, right? Because with the social media age and a lot of things people see on social media, they, they have a way of comparing themselves to others. And when you see certain people doing certain things, it's, it's kind of like, how come I, I'm not there? I'm working harder than them or, or whatnot. But it's really all you can control is yourself. You can't control what other people say. You can't control what other people do. If you really want to make the most out of your life, you have to really hold yourself accountable. And that goes to, I guess, a victim mindset, right? Can you talk a little bit about a victim mindset and kind of how that might hold people back? Because like I said, you can see people on social media or wherever it may be, like, how come I'm not there when I'm working harder, just as hard as they are? Yeah, yeah. First off, social media, so much of social media is not real. Right. Right. It's, it's yeah. a facade. So don't compare yourself to people on social media. But yeah. But the notion of a, a victim mindset can be can be real obvious or it can be really subtle. But it's this notion that <clears throat> that things happen in my life that I don't have control over, right? That if I'm if I'm struggling somewhere, that it's not my fault, it's someone else's fault. So a victim, and by the way, there are true victims in life. That's not what I'm saying. I'm right, talking right. about this mindset that says that looks for excuses for me for not performing. Mm -hmm. Whether it's not being a good husband, whether it's whether it's being overweight and out of shape, whether it's not doing what I'm supposed to do at my business, right? I, mm -hmm. I, I, the victim mindset doesn't look inward; it looks outward. It says, "Okay, you know, why did this happen? If only I had a different boss. If only I was married to a different person. If only I had the opportunities Derek has." Right? right. That's the way a victim mindset works, and it's really easy because it's easy to look outside ourselves. It's easy to say, "Okay." Uh, you know, when gas prices come back down or, you know, when the war ends in, in the Ukraine or whatever else it is, right? When the stock market settles down, when the real estate market, whatever it is, right? You don't control any of that. Mm -hmm. And so the, the accountable mindset recognizes those things. I mean, we don't pretend it doesn't exist, mm -hmm. but the accountable mindset really um, looks forward as to what can I do moving forward. And given that, what do I do now? Where the victim mindset is almost rear view mirror. It's looking for some reason, some excuse, someone or something to blame for my lack of success. The accountable mindset is looking forward saying, okay, in spite of the circumstances I find myself in, you know, what can I do to better the situation? Right. And then taking those actions and learning from that. And so it's a completely different mindset that, that takes you in two very different directions. Like you said, there are people out there that have had bad circumstances happen to them or been a victim of whatever it may be. They've had some hardship in their life. And, but I, something I've noticed a lot of times, those victims that find things have the accountable mindset, right? They, they see these things that have happened to them in the past and they say, how can I bounce back from this? And how can I make my life better? So I don't make this who I am. So I don't make what happened to me who I am. And a lot of people when, like you said, when they don't reach their goals or what they think is their full potential, they have that sort of victim mindset to where I didn't do a good enough job or I didn't do what I needed to do. So I'm not where I'm at. What, what, 
what happened to me? Why is this person getting that? But ultimately, I mean, it's, it's your choice, like you said. Yeah, so that victim mindset leads to frustration. It leads to envy and jealousy. It leads to more inaction. Um, and really, as I said earlier, giving away your power to, <clears throat> to really change it. Mm -hmm. So do you think that people with both accountable mindsets and a victim mindset are both capable of holding each other accountable? Or do you think there are some people out there that just might not be capable to hold themselves accountable and they kind of need other people out there to like hold their hand? Well, I think everybody innately has the ability to hold themselves accountable mm -hmm. to whatever degree they want. Mm -hmm. um, the reason we use peer support is because there is something about human nature that oftentimes I'll let myself off the hook or let, uh, before, before I'll let someone else, right? I'll let myself down, but I don't want to let someone else down who's looking in, right. who's watching. So I don't want to be embarrassed. A little bit of personal pride kicks in. And so th that's real. So let's leverage that, right? Let's, no matter how accountable you are, you're going to probably perform better mm -hmm. if, if you've got some peer support. Now that doesn't mean someone's trying to hold you accountable. It's not their job for you to perform. It's not their job to create negative consequences when you don't. They're just there to have a brief conversation with you on a regular basis, like week weekly to talk about what's working, what's not working, and what do you want to do about it this week? <laughs> so do you think there are still points in time where the people need to be held accountable to things are still relevant in business or, or that sort of sense yeah. of things? So here's what I would say. When we talk about holding people accountable, it is about creating a negative consequence. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Um, and so the problem with that in an organization is that's a consequence model that most people don't even understand how it works. But the, the bigger problem with it as part of the model is that <clears throat> you're trying to get positive behavior from negative consequences. Right. And the best you'll get is you'll get just enough to stop the consequences. Mm -hmm. So you never get the discretionary effort and it always comes with collateral damage. Right. <clears throat> so we would say, no, it's not you don't ever have to hold someone accountable. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, you hold them capable, which isn't passive. Mm -hmm. It's very confronted, but it's confronted with <clears throat> their choice and the consequences of the choices. That doesn't mean that as a leader, you might not apply consequences mm -hmm. to, but it's, it's with the understanding that they're choosing these consequences, whether they're positive or negative, based on the choices they make around their behaviors and the actions they take or don't take. Mm -hmm. And so it's a big difference mm. um, because, because I ask people in our workshops, I'm like, can you force someone to do something? And after we talk through that a while, everyone agrees, no, you really can't. Right. I mean, you might create a consequence that's so distasteful that they choose to do it, but that's where all the negative, con right? All the collateral damage comes yeah. in. And, and so that's what happens when we try and hold people accountable, Right. Mm -hmm. Holding them capable is different. We're going to confront them and they're going to understand that there are consequences, positive or negative, depending on how they perform. And that in the end, they're choosing those and what do they want to do, right? So, right. so it, it takes the monkey off the leader's back mm -hmm. and puts it on the performer's back, which is where it should be. Yeah, because that's another thing where I think is important because you speak to a lot of leaders, you speak to a lot of executives and you go around traveling doing that. I, I would say from my experience, the best leaders and the best managers or whoever it may be are people that can put their full trust into their employees and try and, and be there to support them. But ultimately, it's up to the employee. And I feel when employees have the feel like they have the trust of their manager or their leader, then that's where they're the most productive. Yeah, I, I would agree. Right. And how is that trust built? It's not built by me. Um, doing things with you and then coming along and hammering you when you miss the mark. Right. That erodes trust. Mm -hmm. So it's really mm -hmm. about me coming alongside you, confronting the breakdowns, <clears throat> really coaching you to, to higher performance or, or if that's not something you're on board with, then, then I coach you out of the organization. Mm -hmm. Right. And those are decisions that are needing to be made by, by the leaders. And it also goes to the employees too, because a lot of employees, entrepreneurs, whatever it may be, they might kind of fit into, they get comfortable, right? And when you're comfortable, you kind of get used to, 
I guess the the monotony of the day or just getting going from point A to point B, right? And they're just doing the going through the motions instead of trying to grow. And I know you talk about in the book, there are the three different zones, the comfort zone, the growth zone, and the panic zone. And from what it says in the book, the most the most productive is when you kind of sit inside that growth zone, right? Right, right. But yeah, because there's no growth in comfort. And in panic, there's very little growth either. Right. <laughs> um, and, and so it's that growth zone, making sure that you're pushing yourself uh, into that zone is where I, I think that's what makes life really rewarding and worth living. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're hanging out in the comfort zone, you know, that's I, for me anyways, that 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 feels like a life wasted. Right. There's a, we have a sign in our office and it's, it's a big square and it says your comfort zone. And then there's a circle right outside of that big square. And it says where the growth happens, Yeah. right? Because when you step outside your comfort zone and then that's where the most growth in life happens, whether it's business, professional, personal, and it's important to stay outside of there, but you don't want to go too far outside to where you get into this area and you just start like you said panic zone like you start panicking and freaking out so can you talk a little bit about the panic zone and kind of what you see when when you get to that point just outside of the growth zone like what's the difference between the panic zone and the growth zone well one of the things you'll find is that if you don't if you're not intentional about getting outside your comfort zone at some point you're going to end up in the panic zone Mm. because the rest of the world is changing right and what worked yesterday doesn't work quite the same today. And, and so if you're not intentional about stepping out, at some point, you're going to be forced out of that. And that's when it's panic because the change is so massive, mm-hmm. right? And, and the panic zone is, is, is usually, um, you know, usually areas where there's just massive, massive amounts of change or it's chaotic, mm-hmm. right? It's not, it's not intentional. It's not manageable. It's, um, it's what it says, right? When you think about that, you get shortness of breath, you're, you, you know, there's no clear path, you can't think straight, right? That's not what we're trying to do. That's not where the growth is, because you're not effective there, right? right. Back to mindset. Mm-hmm. The, <clears throat> the mindset is, hey, I'm going to try some things, knowing some of them are going to work, some of them aren't. But what I'm pushing towards is to get to this level. Mm-hmm. That's what I got my eye focused on. That's what I'm working towards. Some of the stuff's going to work, some of it's not, but I'm not going to just try it once and stop. I'm going to keep at it. I'm going to dial it in. I'm going to work through it. I'm going to get some advice. I'm going to meet with my accountability buddy, get a little encouragement, whatever it takes, right? But the, it's this notion of, of leaning into it. And the panic zone isn't something you want to lean into. The panic zone is typically something you want to run from because it's that, that chaotic, that intense. And there's not a lot of growth there because you're just not at your best in the panic zone. So would you say, because when you get into the growth zone and that's, like you said, you're, you're out there and you're trying things that make you uncomfortable. It's okay to be uncomfortable, but you don't want to get panicked for, for someone my age and in their mid twenties. And they're really trying to find out where their next point in life, because when you get out of college and you're trying to figure out where your what your next step is, and you start trying different different career paths do you think it's a good idea to try a bunch of different things and that is where growth comes from well growth comes from exposure Mm -hmm. right and and so you can play it safe and get very little exposure over your lifetime and have very little growth and Mm -hmm. and and the value of growth is that life becomes richer right you're you're able to accomplish more you're able to do more you're living into what you're capable of your impact's bigger so you know that that comes as you're intentional about pushing into that that growth zone. And, and so it comes with exposure. So especially when you're young, right, you have a lot of runway in front of you. Mm-hmm. You can try some things that don't work out. It's no big deal. Right. If you're 60 and you're starting up a new business, you don't have as many years to make it work, but, but I'd still encourage that, right? Mm-hmm. If that's really on your heart, you know, so follow what you love to do. Um, what I like, what I talk to my kids about is look, find, figure out what you love to do and, and what you can make the money at the, for the lifestyle you want and where those two intersect, that's the sweet spot, right? That's what you should be doing. Something that you're good at, you love to do, you can make a contribution with, and it affords you the lifestyle you want. So if you want a tiny house, 
mm-hmm. right? And that's all, right? And you have a small budget like that, then you don't need a lot of money. So uh, on the other hand, if you, you know, if you like some of the nicer things, you want to travel, you want a, a house, maybe cottage, that kind of stuff, you're going to need more income. So where does that intersect with what you like to do and what, what you're good at and where you can contribute, right? What can you bring to others that they want and need? What's, yeah. right? what's the what's the service or product that you're going to bring that's going to make a difference for them? Right. And that, and honestly, that's a, that's a big point on what people need to figure out and why I wanted to start doing this. It's because getting to have someone like you on to kind of talk about the best, the approaches on how to be as productive as you can in certain timeframes, because kind of going back to the 12 week year to wrap this up in the 12, we, we kind of talk about when you have a year long goal, say it's, I want to work, I want to read 10, 12 books, a book a month, right? And then say the first month, you don't read that whole book. And then you get to month two, it's like, oh, I have to read two books now. And then you just fall behind, fall behind, fall behind. But in the 12 week year, you kind of talk about just don't, don't worry about falling behind. You're not falling behind, track your progress, look at what you didn't do the week before, and then focus on getting better at that next week and just focus on doing that next week. Cause that's so important because when you feel like you're falling behind, then you just get buried and you just get stuck. Yeah. You get that overwhelm. Right. So it's, it's really just part of that is recognizing your progress. Mm-hmm. You know, if all we focus is on the outcomes, it becomes paralyzing because mm-hmm. we don't control outcomes. Mm-hmm. So really focusing on the actions and are you taking the actions? And, and if you had a bad week, that's okay. Shake it off, man. The 12 week year is a guilt free zone. You're right. going to stumble. You're going to have some bad weeks. That's all right. Let's, let's figure out how we recover this week. Let's not, mm-hmm. let's not take four weeks to recover. Let's recover right now <clears throat> because I can and, and get back at it. Yeah, that's, that I think is the most important thing a lot of people need to hear. Because like you said, that's where the doubt creeps in and that's where you kind of fall behind and, and then you're, you're just kind of, you get stuck, but it's important to say, you know, I'm not perfect. I wasn't made perfect. I'm not going to do everything perfect. I'm going to have bad weeks. It's just, how do you get consistent at making sure that you're not having back to back bad weeks or (laughs) constant bad weeks and making sure that you can become consistent in your actions. And that also creates good habits, right? Right. And how do you, how do you assess a good week from a bad week? If it's all on outcomes, you're going to struggle right? because you don't control the outcomes. So with the 12 week year, the way we assess a good week and a bad week is how much of the stuff that I said was critical to me accomplishing my goals. Did I do last week? Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, cause you're in the program. So we measure that we score that. And, and that, that kind of gives us an indication of week by week, you know, am I, am I consistent with the things that really matter or do I need to do I need to address some breakdowns there? Do I need to confront some of these actions that I'm not taking and figure out why I'm avoiding them and what's it going to take for me to get in there and mix it up a little better? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's something a lot of people can really take from take from this book. Brian, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to join me. I know this is something I've looked forward to for a long time. A lot of people in the company in general are very excited mm-hmm. to... Uh, to, to listen to this and hear more. And I appreciate you sending me Uncommon Accountability. I was really excited to read that. And it, it is such a fascinating thing because, yeah, there is definitely a negative stigma about accountability. So I recommend people uh, take a look at that. But where can they find both of the books at? Well, well they're both on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all of that. Um, you can go to 12weekyear.com and find all our stuff as well. That's the, the digits, 12weekyear.com. Okay. Awesome. Well, again, thank you, Brian. I really appreciate you taking the time and for everyone listening, thank you for turning into another episode. Uh, If you have any ideas or anything else you would like to talk about, please uh, reach out to me and I'd be happy to do it. And I will catch you guys on the next episode.